<laughs> you know, I've waited a long, long time for this occasion, and I'm sure glad it didn't get here any sooner. <laughs> Duck. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All I do is know, right? Yep. Did that do it? No. You guys get it? I got it? Yeah. Oh, I got it. All right. All right. Wow. It's good to be back. Yeah. Actually, exactly three years ago, it was three years ago this month that I preached here at the church. And uh, my title, my message then was, Our God is an Awesome God. Today it's the King of Hearts. The reason is because that's the name of the, tie the title of the sermon that I preached, the first sermon that I preached here 50 years ago. But I just want to say I, I appreciate the church for allowing me to be here on this occasion. I really appreciate it. And uh, lots and lots of reasons, of course, that I love this church so much, so much for lots of years before I had to leave Auburn. And then when I was at a convention several pre several years after that, the pastor of the convention would ask me, why in the world would you leave that church in Auburn? I said, I was temporarily out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate your pastor, Rob. You know, I met him the first time, oh, a few years ago, when I was asked to officiate for the funeral of a dear friend here. And uh, it was after my retirement. And uh, during my uh, pastor, I, I'd worked with lots of pastors, lots of, in their churches a lot of times, but I don't know if, uh, if I ever was with one that was more cordial, more cooperative, and more, any more helpful than Rob was when I was here at that time. Because, of course, I, you know, I hadn't preached here or anything up until uh, three years ago. And uh, so I, I just, you know, I just didn't know quite what to do and everything, but whatever. Rob just came right in and helped me in. And you can't imagine how much I appreciate it. You know, I think of other pastor, pastor like a pastor. And, uh, and I, I, I know a lot of pastors. And I've known them for uh, lots of pastors, lots of years. But I don't think any that I know of have been any more cooperative than Rob was on that particular occasion. And I have appreciated that. And I appreciate him for opening his pulpit today. Thank you for having me today. Uh, it's my blessing, I'll guarantee you. And I hope you get some blessing out of it today. I'm going to be reading from the uh, third chapter of Ephesians, <clears throat> beginning with verse 16. And then I'm going to uh, refer to a few more passages so I get into the message. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul, at this point, on the 14th verse, he indicates that he's getting ready to pray for those Christians there at Ephesus. And he had been suggesting the kind of lives that they needed to live. And then he begins to pray for that kind of life. This is probably the most important prayer that the Apostle Paul ever prayed that's recorded. And I'm reading commentaries and so forth, have given indication that probably it's one of the most important prayers, other than the prayer of Jesus, that was in the whole Bible. Because it speaks very directly to what God wants in every Christian's life. The Apostle Paul started praying for those Christians. He is expressing his will for you and me today. When Paul prayed and said that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner being that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all of God's people the length, the width, the length, the depth, the height and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then he says, unto him 
who is able to do exceedingly abundantly and above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Bow with me, please, as I pray. Father, we humble our hearts before you today. We know that you're here in our presence today. And it's a glory to us just to realize that. And our simple prayer this morning is that you would teach us and be glorified among us because we pray in Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, I asked a friend of mine a long time ago, actually right after I became a Christian. I became a Christian 24 years old. And incidentally, that was 60 years ago this year. Uh, and 10 years later, I had finished seminary and I was pastoring this church. But anyway, going back to that, I asked him, he was a friend of mine, and uh, it, it was just a little while after I'd become a Christian, and I didn't know that you're supposed to inquire about people's lives, uh, whether or not they're a Christian and that sort of thing. So I said, Carl, let me ask you something. Are you a Christian? He thought for a minute, he said, hey, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a good guy. I keep all the rules. Sure, I'm a Christian. You know, I thought about his answer. Actually, what he was trying to describe to me is what kind of behavior I thought that he needed to have as a Christian. And I got thinking about that. And you know, I think that for every Christian, that's something that we ought to think about. What kind of behavior do we need to have in this world of chaos? I, this passage of scripture we read here a few moments ago, I want to share just a little bit about that as a background. First of all, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever really thought about, does God really give us standards? Do I really know what our Christian life, Christian lives ought to be? Do you really know what we need to live up to in order to meet God's standard? Of course, immediately you're going to say, we're supposed to be like Jesus. Now, because the 29th verse, the 8th chapter says, that he preordained that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. What about what he, when he said, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Wow. That's, it may be considered as a standard, but it's more of, hey, living up to that standard, be perfect, really, I guess what he was saying, in essence, is best I can figure out anyway by what I've read and studied and so forth. Actually, he was saying, because that confuses a lot of people. Be therefore perfect, even if your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, that's pretty high order, isn't it? What he is saying, simply, I think, to us is that, you know, God has set a standard for you. And God expects you to live up to that standard just like he lived up to the standard he has given for himself. <coughs> In other words, God has given us a standard by which to live. And he has given us that standard for lots of reasons because of the reason one, because of the reason that Christ came into this world. Because you see, when we're meeting that standard, there is a certain something that comes forth from our lives that the rest of the world will see. Which, incidentally, the world doesn't get to see very often, unfortunately. Which, as a result, we look about us and find out why our world is in such chaos. I've uh, read on one occasion that the Apostle Paul gave his definition for the, the Christian standard. And it's in the second chapter of Galatians, where the 20th verse, where he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet, not I but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, I, I think that that's a pretty good model and I think that's a pretty good definition of what God expects of our lives. But that also helps us to understand not just what is expected of us in terms of what we are to be, but it also helps us to understand how to arrive 
at the standard. Because he, when he, if you understand something about uh, the testimony he gave when he said he was crucified with Christ, you, you understand that he was speaking of something that was going on in his heart, that every Christian is admonished to consider for their lives on an ongoing basis. One passage of scripture, I think it's in the fifth chapter or sixth chapter of Romans, I forget now, where he says, Reckon ye yourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Apostle Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm reckoning myself dead indeed because Christ died for me. I'm still on that cross as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> now we're talking about how God wants us to arrive at that standard. So he, he's thinking, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm reckoning myself dead with Christ. You know, back a long time ago, the early days of my ministry, there was a radio preacher that on a regular radio program, and uh, he would always, in his broadcast, would say, kind of stop for a minute, he would say, are you listening? In every heart, there is a throne, and there is a cross. When you are on that throne, Christ is still on that cross in your heart. But when Christ is on that throne, you are on the cross. And that's the idea that Apostle Paul had. He said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless not I. Uh, he said, nevertheless I live, yet not I. And you know in the Greek word, Greek language, did you know that that word I that he uses there is pronounced in the Greek? Ego, imagine that. Yet not ego. Now he was thinking of it a little differently than you and I would think of ego today because we have to look at it as selfishness, that sort of thing, and, and proud of ourselves. But actually, in, a, in, a, in effect, this is what he was saying too because whatever I meant to him, he says, this is what's crucified, yet not I, it's not me that's living, it is Christ who is living his life through me. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And Christ lives in us, we live, he lives his life through us. And the life I now live, he said, I live by faith. We're talking about how to arrive at the standard that God wants us to rise to in becoming what he wants us to become in order that we can shine like we need to shine into this world. Paul gives another picture, which I think is closer to what he would like to, uh, the God would like for us to arrive at. And that's the passage that I read a few moments ago in the third chapter of Ephesians, where when he was praying there that, that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory. And we're, you know, we're talking about that. We're talking about all of the perfections, all of the revealed perfections of Almighty God. In other words, everything that God has ever revealed to us, it is made available for us to become what he wants us to become. And out of those riches, Paul says, this is what I, I'm praying, that, that he would grant you out of this to be Strengthened with might. That word might is elsewhere translated power. Strengthened with that kind of power. Said, he said, by, by his spirit. And we know that when we're filled with the spirit, when we're walking in the spirit, when we have a sense of being in the will of God, knowing that the spirit of God is working in our lives, this is when he wants to empower our lives. Said, and this is happening, you're going to be being empowered by the Spirit that Christ may dwell in your heart. I think, as, as much as I hate to think that it's the case in the Living Bible, which is more of a translated Bible, and it doesn't even try to come close to being word for word 
for the original writing of the Bible. Yet, I think the, the living Bible probably captured what that word dwell, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, it says. Actually, it means to come into your life and sit incidentally. He was praying for Christians. It's assumed that Christ was already in their heart. You're not praying that Christ will come into your heart, but that indwelling, he uses the word that literally means, just like I come home when I come home and open the door and come in, man, I feel at home. My wife comes over there and, well, anyway. <laughs> and, you know, this is exactly the idea that Christ is in my life and I am, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ we are in fellowship one with the other. We're in the business of being what he wants to do in our lives together. He said that, that Christ may, I mean, incidentally the Living Bible says that Christ may be more and more at home in your life. I think that comes a little closer to it. Even the New International Version doesn't say uh, it just says, well, I think just like all the rest of them. But anyway, he wants to come into our lives. And, and this is the picture that Paul, because see, the very next thing, Christ is in that life. And Christ is at home, fellowship, fellowshipping with the person of that heart. And then it says, that you may be able to be, you may be able to, with, to, to comprehend, or the, the King James, it, and some of them says to apprehend. And the other, the idea is to mentally really get a grasp of that love. Because you see, Christ is dwelling, all of a sudden the love appears. And it starts being described here in its appearance as a, a tremendous vastness of love. He says that you may be able to comprehend what is the width. And the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. He's talking about there, of course, the knowledge that, that he said that you may know. That's experiential knowledge. You got this all, and Christ in our lives, we're beginning to really experience this. But we can keep on experiencing it, experience it, and, and experience it. And we'll never use it all up because it's so vast. He said that you may comprehend with all of God's people the vastness of this. And let me tell you something right now. In, in background of what we're looking at, we want to recognize that this is the key, the love of Jesus Christ. He says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then he says unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. And it's talking about the power, according to the power that works in us. It's that same power that when God has his way in our lives, when Jesus Christ really is the king of our hearts, that he has been being flooding our hearts, not only with the power, but I want to remind you that God's love is an attribute of God, and wherever God in His Spirit happens to show up, that love happens to show up right along with Him. Doesn't make any difference what He's doing as long as it's redemptively. As long as He is working in our lives redemptively, that love is going to show up also. It may not be show up in the sense that that, because when we think of power, that's what we're after when we want God's power as such. But that love, my friends, we can never get too much of it, but we need to know. And we need to open our hearts. And we need to surrender our lives to our Lord Jesus Christ in the extent to where we can get enough of that that it would just feel as though it's bursting forth to shine as a radiant light into this world. I'm saying this world of chaos. And corruption. And beloved, they need it. The, the thought that came to me, oh God, how we need you now in this world. Or to 
share with you a story that I told 50 years ago to the church that was the church, this church at that time. It's about a, a gold miner in Klondike District of Yukon Territory back in the gold rush days. It's actually, uh, this is also obviously where I get my, got my title then, but the sermon that I preached then is absolutely nothing like the one I'm preaching today, but the, but the title in, and this illustration is, but the gold miner. And there was one cold winter night, night in the Yukon Territory during that gold rush day, and he was walking through the streets of one of the villages that sprung up, and he heard music over the way, and he went down, and he saw the lights. He just reasoned about it. And, and he saw the lights, it was a tavern. And he heard the, you know, when he got a little closer, he heard all of the noise that's usually, I, I wouldn't know about that sort of thing, but I've heard that noise. <laughs> but anyway, he went over and he, and he went in, he looked around, and he saw a big pot belly, belly stove, so way over in one corner there, there was a card table there by it, and he made his way over there because he was freezing. He wanted to warm his hands up a little bit. When he got his hands warmed up, he reached down to that table and he picked up a deck of cards. He thumbed through the deck of cards and he pulled out a king of clubs and held it up. And then he raised his voice and started getting people's attention. He said, I have come to the Klondike to represent the king who has Established one which is greater than any club, organization, or fraternity known to mankind, the Church of Jesus Christ, of which he is the head. Put it down. And he picked up the King of Diamonds. He lifted it up. He said, I've come to the Klondike to represent the King. And then he started singing the old song. My father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth wealth of the worlds in his hands, of rubies, of diamonds, silver and gold. His coffers are full. He hath riches untold. And he stands ready to fill your life according to the riches of his glory. And then he took up the king of spades. And he held it. I have come to the Klondike to represent the king who will undo the work of the grave digger's spade on the day of resurrection. And he began to quote from the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of the voice of the archangel. The trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he picked up the king of hearts said, I have come to the Klondike to represent the king of hearts. Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God, he put it down, he walked to the door, and he turned around, and he said, It is not gold. It is Jesus Christ who is the greatest treasure of all, mm -hmm. even in the Klondike. And he walked out with the spirit of the 19th chapter of the book of, Re book of the Revelation, Give hallelujah chorus in his heart, saying, The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah. And he walked out into the cold again. You know, I'm I'm not a preaching gold miner, and I'm certainly not a gold mining preacher. <clears throat> to excuse the implication. But I borrowed that sermon on the title from that story. But you know, there's one reason that I'm here other than just that, that I'm preaching what I'm preaching other than just that. You know, I don't know if you've noticed it, surely you must have, because you use the word often, probably don't even recognize that you use the word heart. 
So the word heart is used figuratively in the English language, also in the Bible, and probably in just about every other language. We use the word heart to give emphasis to some circumstance in our personal life. You ever hear anybody say, oh, he got tilted, his heart is broken. That's all right, he's got courage. He's got heart. You hear that? All kinds. You know, I looked this up in the dictionary, and there was a list that long of the way you used heart. It's like I just used it there. Some of them I've never used, but there's a lot of them in the Bible. But that's not all the only reason that I use the king of hearts, because one of the reasons I like to refer to Jesus Christ as the king of hearts, because I like to think that Jesus Christ is the king of my heart. And more specifically, I like to think that Jesus Christ is at home and king in my heart. But what if? What if he is king in my heart and in control of my heart? Or yours, for that matter. What difference does it make? And I know what you you, know, you can say, whoa, whoa. If you, you say, you're asking that question too. If, in fact, it does make a difference, some kind of difference, whatever that is, what effect does that have? On your own life or anything else? And then, I'm glad you asked that question because I already hear your mind rattling, I mean, thinking. You said, oh, well, for goodness sakes, Doc, you know that that, that kind of an effect could have a tremendous, that kind of, could have a tremendous effect on all kinds of things. Yeah, I agree. But let me just give you some examples. I think that when you hear some of these testimonies, well, actually, I'm going to give you think, about three here. I've, I've got several testimonies that help us to understand where in this world today, that kind of change, that kind of difference that's made in our lives, want to help you to understand where it needs to really have an effect in our world today. I want to share with you, first of all, from... <clears throat> I got this bulletin. You may have received one too. Last month, this is the January bulletin, the January publication of the Faith and Freedom Coalition of the United States. And in the second page here, there is an article by the National Prayer Coordinator for that organization. It's written, written an article here entitled, A Prayer for Revival, talking about our nation. And you'll notice right in the middle of this, there's bold print. It's what I want to read to you because they highlighted that deliberately. It was out of what had been written in this. And that coordinator said, we are at a serious crossword, serious crossroads in our nation. A point in which I am convinced that no amount of political posturing can resolve. You know exactly what. Well, I hope you know. If you watched the news, if you've read the newspaper, if you've been getting any of those envelopes that says, please help us in this cause or that cause. And I remember 35 years ago, almost 35 years ago, when James Draper, uh, he published a book. I read he'd written a book, and it was published in 1979. And in that book, he said that we are in one of the most dangerous days spiritually that has ever dawned. And he was talking about those organizations that call themselves Christians that actually is the biggest heresy that lie about Christianity or the mis the misinterpreting Christianity that you can imagine. He says, it is literally sweeping across our nation. That was 35 years ago. Have you looked around? Have you really taken a look at what's going on and how we're sitting? I mean, anyway, how it's making progress. Let me go a little bit further. We know 
that we're, we're quite aware that the political scene is not doing a cotton picking bit of good. And he said, no, no matter what, how much posturing they do, in other words, they can turn it upside down, backwards, inside out, however they, what, but it doesn't do any good with the problem. And you and I know that, and boy, do we know it right now in our nation. Do we really know it in the world that we live in? I want to, I'm going to read something else to you. <clears throat> this, I got in the email, it was, it was called and titled, The Shortest Speech That the President of Russia Ever Made. You probably got one, I don't know, you may got one too. But he was speaking to the Russian Duma, the, the Russian Parliament. And it was concerning the immigrants had, that were coming in, primarily the Muslims, who adhere to the Islam religion, which has been contrary to Christianity since Christianity's beginning, and to Israel before that, since its beginning. And this is what he says. And I want you to listen to this really closely because we're listening to the president of Russia speaking to the parliament, Russian parliament, August of this past year, the last August. And I read this and I thought to myself, oh, I wish one of our politicians would have said that to our nation. I'm just going to take a few statements out, just, I'm mean, just very, very quickly. He started, his very first word simply was, in Russia, live like Russians. Down the way he said, if they prefer Islam law and live a life of, like Muslims, then we advise them to go to those places where the, that's the state law. A little, a little further down he says, we will not tolerate disrespect of our Russian culture. This next statement, I want you to underline in your heart because he's going to use the word suicide and he is not referring to individual human suicides, he is referring to the suicides of nations. And he says, we had better learn from the suicides of America Holland, or England, Holland, and France, if we expect to survive as a nation. And then he said, pertaining to America, England, Holland, and France, he said, because the Muslims are taking over those countries that doesn't surprise you, does it? Especially after you hear one of the popular songs that's coming out of England now. I don't know if you've heard that song or not. I've only heard it one time. Only I think that it's great how one of the, the one of the singing groups there, well, I guess it's a contemporary singing group, that sings, was singing a song of how they get all the, I'm just, I'm going to sum it up in a statement. Like, they get all the the blessings and we pay all the bills. Does that sound familiar? Let me read another. I'm going to read something else to you real quickly by David Jeremiah. You may have read the book a couple of weeks ago. I was down at the uh, Baptist book, not Baptist bookstore, but the Christian bookstore in uh, Roseville. And I just happened to pick up uh, and looked in Billy Graham's new book. And also a fellow of the name of, of uh, a, a pastor there in uh, uh, El Camon, I think it is. Anyway, it's the San Diego area. David Jeremiah. His book is entitled, I Thought That I Would Never, I Never Thought That I'd Live to See the Day. And then I, when I opened that up, I opened just automatically, I knew and reasoned that the chapter titles would be expressing what he had in mind. I never thought I'd live to see the day. 
that are open here. I asked my daughter to go back down there and copy these down for me, and I've got it on her writing. <laughs> But I, I just uh, underlined uh, two or three or four of them, something like that. He said, I never thought I'd live to see the day when Christians wouldn't know that they were in a war. Does that strike home? It did me. I had to think a little bit. When Jesus would be so profane, when marriage would be a become obsolete. When morality would be in free fall. When the Bible would be marginal. When the church would be irrelevant. When the Muslim state would could intimidate the world. When America would turn her back on Israel. Let me just read one quick comment from Billy Graham. And these are all, these are current. These are today's type thing. But at the same time I was there, I, I did look through his book, which is called My Hope of Billy Graham's book, My Hope America. But during the Christmas time, my son David and Karen, his wife, bought me that American Icons Special Edition had Billy Graham. It was about the whole thing was on Billy Graham. It's a big, uh, thick thing, magazine size. And uh, I started reading that. And I got the last page. There was a quotation from uh, they were writing about Billy Graham's letter to his supporters in his effort to generate what what he's calling My Hope America. And in this letter, there was a quotation, and this is what he said to his supporters, which I wished I would have said. He said, if there ever was a time this country needed the intervention of God, it is now. We can, should, and should pray for America as a whole, but remember that when God sets out, sets out to change a nation, he begins by changing people and then he says, it starts with individuals. It starts with individuals. Go back. When God begins to change a nation, America, my hope. We're talking about today the love of Christ shining through Christians' lives. Now, <clears throat> let me just mention to you, I doubt very seriously as a Christian that you've been a Christian very long without somehow realizing that as you look about us in this chaotic world that we're living in today, that something is coming out of some hearts all over the world. Actually, whether it's in the family or in the nation, it's coming out of the heart. The man thinketh in his heart so easy, the Bible says. Well, if the man thinks in his heart, so does he also. So thinks he also. And we need to remember that because there are, in fact, two primary forces in this world that we need to take into consideration. One of them is, in fact, the love of Jesus Christ being demonstrated in and through the Christian's life shining out into the world. That's a powerful, powerful, very powerful force. The trouble of it is, there's just not very much of it in our world today. But on the other hand, the other force, which is, in fact, the human nature devoid or without the love of Jesus Christ. And you can go back to the Garden of Eden and you see where that starts where those two right at the beginning begin to rebel against God or disobey God or forget that God's will was needed to overcome theirs, but theirs just did its own way. And what happened has been happening ever since. They did something wrong. And they said to God, Adam first, she made me do it. What he was trying to do is 
to justify his wrong actions. And that's what's happening in all over our world. That same way uh, Eve did the same thing. The snake told me to do it. The snake lied to me. Trying to justify it. You follow Adam and Eve and their descendants right on down to pages of history 2014. February 2014 if you please. And you look around you and you'll see that force of the human nature without the love of Christ in it. And when you see that, you see chaos in the world. Actually, <clears throat> when you think about the love of Christ in people's lives shining forth, you're thinking about a force that is directed in the context of God's will and motivated by God's love. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you look at that other force to see what's really happening in this world, you see something that is directed under the will of self and motivated by the love of self. Now, you see the two sides of that picture. And you've also seen the two sides of something else. We started off with taking a look at God's, what, what we feel like must be God's, something of God's standard that he wants us, incidentally, if, if we're talking we're talk about behavior, we have to know what we're supposed to be before we know what we're supposed to do. And this is what we saw in that Ephesian pastor, past, excuse me, passage. And as we, we take a look at that, we will recognize that this is one side of the picture of our world today. But it, it, is, it is so sketchy, so small compared to the other side. The other side we saw, you just got a glimpse in those testimonies, just a glimpse of the cultural corruption that's in our nation and in our world today. I, when, I, when I look at something like this, I think to myself, what in the world are we up to as Christians? And then as we think through this, okay, we've seen, we've seen on the one hand the potential for the love of God shining out into the world. The other side, we've seen this world corruption. We're saying, seeing two sides of the force and we're seeing two sides of the picture that has been affected by the force, by each force in the world. But what I want you to see between those two pictures, you see a Christian gold miner in the Klondike building a bridge. And if you take a look at that picture, even though it was in a tavern, he was building a one-way bridge, a bridge that he had hoped that the self and the love of self would have a means by which they could recognize a way out of the darkness over into the light. <coughs> and I have simply shared that with you to help you realize that we need to be in the Christian bridge building business. I want you just for just a moment, better be just a moment. <coughs> I want to uh, share with you something about a different perspective because this is the perspective of the king himself, the king of hearts. Because he also has something to say about how he feels about what we ought to be up to and what he is up to that he wants to accomplish in and through our lives. In the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, just, just before he gets to the 10th verse, he, incidentally, this, he, this is the chapter where he's talking, he referred to himself as, as the Good Shepherd and is using sheep to illustrate people. And just before he got to the 10th verse, he was talking about those who would come in and destroy the sheep. 
He was talking about this other force that have come in to destroy the sheep. And then he said, but I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, this is where he is. What do we, life, the sheep had life, we have life. Everybody has life until they're dead. But he's come that they might have life. Though he must be talking about something, he was talking about spiritual life as opposed to spiritual death. And we know that the Bible teaches us that without God in the life, that a person is spiritually dead. A spiritual life, he said, that I'm coming to give as opposed to what's going to happen in your life and continue in your life if I don't manifest it. What I have come to give. He said, and that's abundant life. What does he mean by abundant? We talked to him a few moments ago, referred to that, what are the riches of all of his glory available to us. But let me just give you one little quick illustration where it said what happens and all what happens in our lives and God has brought us to the place where he wants us to be in order that we can be filled with all the fullness of God. I would say that that's pretty abundant, would you? <clears throat> Jesus said uh, that, that was a personal thing. Now he, he's going to give expression about where our place is in this. It's a great commission. What else? The 28th chapter of the book of Matthew, 19th, 19th, and, uh, 18th, 19th and 20th verses, where he says, Go ye therefore and make disciples. Go, 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 go. Well, let me back up a little bit. I'm reading what he said to those people there. I'm reading what Jesus said. But let us remind us ourselves that he is saying that to me and you today through this passage. And he is saying, go and make disciples in all nations, teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you, and I'm going to be with you. He says, teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. What? Already we know what one of the commands in particular is. Because I was taught to observe. What was it? What? Make disciples. Very simple. To every disciple, go you therefore. It's the same. Luke puts a, have something to it. It said, beginning at Jerusalem. In other words, begin where you are. To make disciples. Now I want to tell you. That Jesus came into this world to transform. He came into this world to transform the hearts and the lives of people. And you and me, we're just the kind of people that he needs to use to accomplish the way he chose to transform those hearts. Now I know you're thinking about Doc's talking about evangelism. It I would hope we would see that, but that's not what I'm talking about. In as such, actually, you go to the other passages where he talks about the, the, the sowing and reaping. You go to the, said, I am the vine, you are the branches. You abide in me, you will bear much fruit. But we need to build bridges, first of all. We need to plant seeds, first of all. There needs to be. And I know as much as I would love to say, hey, you all need to learn how to lead people to Jesus Christ. That would be the greatest thing in the world. One well, of the most thrilling things in the world to lead people to Christ. But you know what? There have been very few people that have been personally led to Jesus Christ where seeds have not been planted in their lives. Where a bill, a bridge to encourage them when the opportunity to be led. In other words, you and I know people who've already made up their minds that they do not want to be a Christian simply because of what they see in Christians' lives. Anybody not deny that? We talked at the beginning about a standard, the standard that God wants us to live up to. 
I'm going to suggest to you, and you're going to agree in the, your heart, that the average Christian doesn't even come close to living up to God's standard. But, and that's exactly the reason that there is no light shining in the darkness of this world. There's no light shining to encourage people. Because you see, when genuine Christian becomes genuine Christian and giving his lights, and, he, and Jesus said it so very clearly, he said, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That, that word works doesn't mean just being out there preaching, being out there and teaching Sunday school. It's, it's really talking about your lifestyle, the things that you do in your life, your attitude, the way you talk to people, and the way you deal with people, what you do on the job and what you do in the family at home. And it tells us, it's talking about your lifestyle, your behavior, wherever and whatever you're doing. And me. <coughs> you see, we need to turn the light on. We need to build a bridge. We need to plant the seed. We need for people to see Jesus in us. An old song, let Jesus, let others see Jesus in you. I only remember one time in my whole experience while I was pastoring right here when somebody had no idea that I was a Christian. We were, at, we were on vacation. We were spending a few days in Tahoe. We decided to go somewhere we traveling I was cold so I needed to get a jacket so we stopped at a bank along the way and I went in I didn't say anything about Christianity didn't say anything about the church didn't say anything about my profession and I just simply uh, managed to tell them that you know I had money in the bank etc and they checked it out and they gave me money and I turned and started to walk away said sir the lady said you're a Christian aren't you you know what I smiled my old heart just like to burst. I saw a lady next to her. She, she was going like that. I said, I only remember one time that somebody said something like that on an occasion like that. I'm sorry about that. I really am. Because I would like for that to happen every day. We need to win the hearts of Americans if Christianity is going to be what Christianity needs to be. And he went to the door, he turned around and he said, it is not gold, it is Jesus Christ, the greatest treasure of all. And not just in our lives, folks. He needs to be the treasure in all of their lives. Because that's the only thing. It's not going to be the politicians. It's not going to be war. It's going to be Jesus Christ in the lives and through the lives of you and me. And when he said that, with the spirit of the book of Revelation, the 19th chapter in his heart, he said, and heaven opened, and I saw a white horse, and he that sat upon it, true and faithful, King of kings and Lord of lords, and with the hallelujah, the original hallelujah chorus, he walked out. The Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah. God bless you. Pastor would like to take over now. Amen.